So, let me introduce Dr. Joseph uh, Williams, who, who did a dissertation on California superintendents leading district-wide change to advance student success. He is the recipient of the Outstanding Dissertation Award for K-12. Uh, he's also uh, one of Dr. Navarro's students. Uh, so can we welcome uh, Dr. Williams? Thank you and good evening. Um, I agree with Dr. Seifer. I would say a very huge thank you to um, Dr. Navarez, um, who pushed me way further than I wanted to go. Um, I don't really like the fanfare. I, I, I almost wish that I didn't receive this just because uh, <laughs> it's one more engagement where I'm speaking and, and I'm really a reluctant leader. My entire life, I'm just being transparent with you, I've been placed in leadership and I've never really wanted to be. I've always wanted to be a servant leader. I've always wanted to be behind the scenes, um, dumping trash cans. It's just, I don't know. I grew up in the cherry orchards uh, to help my mom, who was a single mom. And I've never really liked being up here. But somehow, I always find myself here. And I credit that to people like Dr. Loiza, Dr. Navarez. Um, I showed my wife Jeff's um, distinguished dissertation title, and she was confused. Um, so you can see why. Uh, he was, he's, he's ex extremely distinguished. Um, I look at Dr. Seifer and um, sh she gets excited about numbers. And, and I love that about her. Um, I could use some help even in, I'm, I'm always about, I mean, I'm looking at change. And um, my entire life I've been trying to change the odds. Change the odds for my family. Change the odds for Bo. Um, even though he has white privilege, I will, tr I will, you better believe I'll tell him about that. Something I didn't know about when I was growing up. And, um, and that's what I'm fighting for. I'm, I'm constantly uh, have been in underserved communities in South Sacramento, um, taught at Luther Burbank as a student teacher, and I've always been fascinated by change. How can it be better? And um, coincidentally, Dr. Navarro is also extremely passionate about that. But I'm also extremely passionate about people um, because you can't do this work. We were talking about complex systems. Systems are filled with people. People are extremely complex and very difficult to um, really um, get to the bottom of and, and to figure out. We had a business uh, man in our cohort who um, came in that he was going to just fix education as a board member and everything else until he realized really how complex um, systematic change is. Um, and it's because we're not dealing with widgets. We're not dealing with... Um, money. Um, we're dealing with people. And it's very, very complex and difficult. Um, so as I was looking at that, um, Dr. Seifer talked about um, the gap. And as I really started to look at the problem, there's a ton of gaps. I always talk about K-12 education as whack-a-mole. You whack one thing and all of a sudden five other things pop up and you're just sitting there going like this. Um, and, and so as I really started to look at the problems in public education, um, for me, uh, uh, um, something to focus on when, when you're talking about the potential um, of a dissertation to have results and transform schools, that's what I wanted. Um, I didn't want a 400-page thing. And I'll actually tell you this. Um, we're building a school. I'm, I was charged, I was hired um, probably in January of last year to start thinking about and planning for it to open a school and to split a school nonetheless, a K-12 school or a 6-12 school into a 6-8 and a 9-12. And so you think about the complexity of splitting a school where there's people entrenched and very comfortable and they don't want change, how do you do that? You have to be very strategic. You have to be very political. These Bowman and Dill, what the heck am I reading this huge thick book? <laughs> you, need, you need to know that stuff. Um, so as I started to really look at the, the, the gaps, not just gap, but the achievement gap, the discipline gap, the teacher gap, where's the shortage? Oh, we have too many teachers, we need to lay you off. Okay, now all of a sudden we, we need to get you back. Come on, we'll pay you more money. The funding gap, the economic gap, the equity gap, um, there's, it's just whack-a-mole. There's a ton of different problems that, that are just so complex and, and how, do we, how do we do this? And so I didn't even know where to begin. As I was coming through the, the, the research, uh, man, it's whack-a-mole. 
Um, and so my research questions, um, I decided you, you got to go to, you have to go to the top, really. I mean, because leaders, leaders have the potential and the power, if used correctly, um, to really make a difference and, and to change. And I hope that's why you guys are here. I hope that's why you're studying um, and, and getting your, your, your doctorate. But I decided to look at what, what is the leadership nature of the superintendency in K-12 schools? What are superintendents doing? And why are they leaving all the time? Why, why are they only lasting one to two years? Um, what are the gaps? Are they prepared even going into, um, if, is that why they're, they're leaving? Um, and then also, what are the, the skills that are necessary for superintendents when, when in order to really advance student success, what, what do they need to do? Because for me, this was not a dissertation. For me, this is, this is, this is my life. I, I, this is my life's work. And, and I'll show you some of the, the, the slides I decided to choose for, um, my from my dissertation. Um, but they're, they're what's in my office. I don't really have an office. I share an office with my secretaries and my vice principal and my counselor. We're in one room. We're in a classroom because our, our school is still being built. And on my wall are these photos. Now, my, my, my degree came in, in over the summer. That's not up yet because this isn't home. But this work is important. This is what I need to be reminded of when I get in early. I need to be looking at these things and, and reminding myself of what's important. And what all these superintendents, because I was told by one um, superintendent in our organization, you'll be lucky if you get 15 uh, superintendents to respond to this survey. They're busy. What, what are you thinking? Um, I was very pleased um, to see when I really broke down, um, there were 112 superintendents who decided to respond. Um, just a quick tip, send it out on, on Sunday nights and send it out late because superintendents get up early or, or leaders, a lot of times, good leaders get up early because there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and what I found is it was like fishing. Send it out Sunday night, I would get up at four and they were just responding like crazy. So I was very pleased to see when I, when I was told, don't tell me I can't do something because it fires me up. And, and so when I heard that, I wanted to um, get as many superintendents as I could. Um, what I saw disappointed me. When I really started to break down the, descript the descriptive statistics, it, it was disheartening to me. Because when you look at who's in charge, 72% white people. No offense to white people. 56% um, male. 41% um, 40, uh, were in their, their 50s. Um, 45% only held the job, over half only held a job for one to two years. 37% um, were only, um, they had only been a superintendent for one to two years. Um, I was shocked about this, 57% only had their master's degree. I, I, I was under the impression you have to get your doctor if you want to be a superintendent. So that's why I went to get my doctorate, because someday I want to be a superintendent. I want to make a positive impact in this difficult, complex system. Um, and, and right there I saw, um, well, this was interesting too, 58% were from rural and small superintendents. What that told me is, hey, the, the superintendents who are in um, diverse communities and dealing with a lot of complex problems, they didn't have time to fill out my survey because they were dealing with what I was dealing with last night with students shooting off mace in classrooms and, you know, interesting stuff, complex stuff. Um, Try explaining that, that to your wife at 9 o'clock. Um, <laughs> and so I saw really, really quickly that I had some limitations in my study. With, with that kind of perspective, you have a very myopic lens that you're looking through. Um, and so, did I go through everything? Um, it, was, it was a mixed method study, but I'll, I'll tell you. Um, when you look at it, I got a bunch of junk from Dr. Loiza and Dr. Navarez that Hey, you, you should have studied. You, you obviously like your qualitative data a lot. It's very heavy. Um, but it's because I love the words, and, I, and I, I cling to people's words. I cling to relationships and conversation. Um, and so this is the research that I looked at. I looked, I've kind of broken it up into quadrants and, and the fact that leadership, um, you need to know effective approaches, really looked at that transformative, transformational leadership, um, this conflict. I mean, we're constantly surrounded. I don't need to go into politics, uh, but it's, it's, it's a crazy world. And it's getting even more conflicting by day. Um, and 
looking at the, the, even the relationships between board members and, and the fighting that goes on and, and how the, the unions and the community and, and parents and staff and students and, and preparation, going back to Dr. Seifer's study, people, oh man, I put all this money into my education and I'm coming out feeling so discouraged because I'm not prepared. What I'm seeing, the reality is I'm not prepared to do what my heart wants to do, and that's to teach these kids because I care about them and I love them and I want to make a difference. But I don't feel adequately trained and prepared. Um, and if you're going to do that, what I really saw is when you're looking at institutional change models, um, there has to be systems in place. There's no way you can just take care of problems and live day by day. There has to be some sort of systematic approach. So I looked at a lot of change theories, systems theories, and leadership theories. And what I found, um, the red, I, you know, because I have word of advice, don't have two kids in a doctoral program. It's very difficult on your marriage, and you have to pay for additional counseling afterwards. <laughs> so I highly recommend, you know, discourage it. Um, but what I found is, it, it, just because I was raising kids, is red light, green light. And, and, <laughs> and so the things that are in red, for me, it was like, hey, Williams, you need to slow down and stop and think about these things. And, and I come into every, work, every, every day to work, and I realize, hey, man, I'm, I'm constantly surrounded by conflict. Um, and as I saw this, um, we, we saw this in our, in our, in our charter, because I'm at a charter school, Aspire Public Schools. We're in Sacramento, Stockton, Bay Area, and we're now in Memphis. And what I saw is, hey, we have to be, we have to own the fact that we need to acknowledge that we need change. And that's what a lot of superintendents um, acknowledged. Um, and, and really, in order to make change, you really have to cast your vision. And, and a good leader casts their vision. A great leader casts their vision often, monthly. Um, communication, like I was saying, people, you have to build relationships. That's not... This, this isn't rocket science. I feel like that's the kind of the aha for me in, in my study. Um, and, but I think that, to Jeff's point, praxis really is about the communication in a relationship. I think about the breakdown between my wife and our relationship. It's usually a breakdown of communication. And it's no different than when I'm interacting with my coworkers, when I'm inter interacting with my leadership team, when I'm interacting with my community members. If I'm not communicating early and often, there's, there's a breakdown, and there's usually issues. And that usually comes through, I don't see trust up here, but I mean, a lot of that, I, a lot of that comes down to a breakdown in trust. If, if we're having issues on school campuses, usually I don't trust you, is what you're saying. I had a teacher ask me the other day, hey, can you sit on a, on a meeting? I said, sure, I have no problem supporting you, as long as you want to communicate indirectly to the parent that you don't trust them. Because the moment an admin's in there, we have issues. You don't trust the parent and how they're going to respond and react. That meeting didn't go well, by the way. Um, <laughs> but what I've seen is, is um, in this that, that throughout, the, throughout the entire process, leadership has to be there. Um, and I thought this was interesting as well, that even though education was like a secondary um, lived experience and work experience, really is what you guys are doing um, to prepare it doesn't feel like it, as, as Jeff said. Um, I'm still looking for my dream job, by the way, because being a principal, I'll tell you what, it's for the birds. Um, but I will say this. If you're doing what you love, and, and really, when I come home and I see my, my kids running at me every day, I'm able to go back and, and really give and serve in, in my community as a principal. Um, and, and I put this one up there, Dr. Navarro. Shout out to you. Um, because really when I think about, this is one of the change models that I used, um, like I said, it's, it's, it's more important to me than my degree from Sac State. It's what I've needed to survive because it's, it's exactly, I mean, it's very similar to what I ended up coming up. And a lot, of, a lot of what the superintendent said and called out in both interviews and 112 surveys was exactly this. Um, so obviously, Dr. Navarro did his research beforehand. Um, and so I would say this, the key findings and recommendation to leaders um, is, is to continue to engage in professional development opportunities, um, which will allow them to collaborate and build positive networks with other superintendents. School leaders should continue to explore the literature on creativity, 
one thing I, I, I realized throughout this process too is schools, I thought that was an interesting thing. I had one superintendent um, out of Layton, I believe, that was studying creativity. And he was doing things, he was working in ways that superintendents were like, nah, I can't do that with unions. And he was so creative in some of the systems that he was laying down. And these are the things that when you, like, that's why I appreciate the praxis and, and, and the research and the, the, the lenses that the EDD gives you because it allows you to see those people get excited and say, I want to I wanna replicate that. I want to bring that back to my district. I want to bring that back to my school. That's what good leaders are doing. They're not trying to implement the same things that aren't working. Um, school leaders should continue to seek out mentors. We need each other. We really do need each other. To get through this program, um, I look at the three people, I, I saw them. We went out almost every single, can we say that? <laughs> Being recorded? We, I mean, after every class, we, we were going out to just debrief and to talk um, because it's, it's very difficult. You need, you need allies, close allies. Um, universities and county offices, kind of like what, what Dr. Seifer was saying, need to continue to reach out and, and there, to build the bridge between higher ed and K-12. We need to be speaking the same language, otherwise we're going, to, we're going to miss each other. We could be shooting at the, you know, using the same equipment and everything, but we're shooting at different targets. And if we're not coordinating working together, we're not going to be preparing kids. They're going to constantly be going through me remediation, and we're going to continue to have some of the gaps that we have. Um, and I think that more, most importantly, and I think it's something that Aspire Public Schools is really good at, and it, and it drives certain people away, is we need to continue to change. We need to continue to set up systems um, and, and try new things so that we're not stagnant and so that we're not trying to, to use the same things to prepare kids um, because we have a very, very different world than we had back in the 60s. Um, so that's pretty, much, that's pretty much it. I can go on, but I think I'm, I think I'm done. Okay.